So what I thought I'd do as part three of my review of, of the JX8P is to go over common issues with this synth. And it's it's quite interesting that there were, there is quite a lot of information about issues that have uh, presented themselves with this 35 year old synth that I've been um, lent by Richard. Um, these are the sort of common issues, the, the especially for something that is an early model, which would be 35 years old. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd go through a number of these. But before we continue, I thought I'd be really upfront here. This is not my synthesizer, and therefore I am not going to open it up. This is Richard's synthesizer, and I think it's unfair if I opened it up and I did some damage to it, that would be, that would be wrong. So I'm not going to open the synthesizer up. I'm just going to point out the, the issues that have been pointed out to me, either through friends who've owned one of these things in the past, or the research that I've done on YouTube in putting together some of the videos that I've been doing. So, let's carry on. Okay, this is the part of the video where we do the channel self-promotion. Very important part of the video, I might add. But we must observe the normal parish notices. Which are, if you haven't subscribed to the channel and you like videos about this sort of thing or these sort of things, you need to hit the subscribe button. If you want to be notified when videos hit the channel, save yourself some time, hit the bell icon at the same point. If you uh, watch the video and you like what you see, please give the video a thumbs up. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. The more thumbs up, the more people get to see what you have obviously enjoyed. Um, also down there, please leave comments. I read them all, I respond to them all, and sometimes they even generate ideas for future videos. Um, down there is the address of the TMTG community for less than the price of a cup of coffee, which is an utter bargain. You can keep this channel rocking and rolling and help the production of videos in the future. And finally, Instagram and Facebook feeds. I know many of you are starting to DM me on those two platforms. Please continue, pop over to Instagram and Facebook, uh, hook me up there or tag me or whatever it is nowadays we will say about Instagram and Facebook um, and you'll see all the channel uh, notices and normal promotions that don't make it to YouTube but now back to this particular video now we come on to aftertouch which was present on this keyboard it wasn't present on the previous PG um, JX 3P but it is present on this keyboard. And like many other keyboards, the way aftertouch is, is, is handled is effectively, there's a hornet or something buzzing outside the window. Um, the way it's done is effectively there is a variable resistor strip that sits underneath the keys. And as you press the keys and then press harder, the resistance of that strip changes and therefore the keyboard knows how what it, that you're trying to apply aftertouch and then whatever parameter you set for aftertouch, it will apply that to the sound. Now I've been told about two um, issues with the aftertouch setup on this keyboard. Um, so it's a common implementation, um, but given the age of the synth, the electrical properties of the strip can degrade. So that means it doesn't give you as much resistance as it did when it came out of the factory 35 years ago. Um, and it, this is especially true if you've been if it's been in damp or humid uh, climates, because those two sort of areas will allow moisture to ingress into that strip. Um, and you know you might find that the strip itself is kaput. Uh, you're not getting any resistance change when you start pressing the keys and you start pressing them harder. Um, if that's the case, you've got two options. One is you can try and see if you can buy a replacement strip, and I'm not sure whether other models aftertouch strips are compatible with this one. Um, but what, what somebody told me is you can also do is you can recarbon the strip, which effectively means that you paint carbon paste onto that graphite strip um, and allow it to sort of recalibrate itself. If you have to change the strip or if you have to recarbon it, you're going to change the electrical properties, which kind of brings me on to, on to the second issue that has been raised on this. 
is that the way that the aftertouch is effectively calculated and sent to the synth for action is through uh, an, op an operational amp circuit. Effectively what that means is it takes the signal, the resistance signal that comes off of this, off of the strip and then it amplifies the gain uh, so the keyboard can actually find out how hard you're pressing the keys for aftertouch. And I'm not going to go into the whole sort of op amp and, and configuration of it here because there, are, if you read um, the service manual, which is available online, I know I have a physical copy here, but it is actually available online. You can see the circuit diagram for the aftertouch circuit. And there are three resistors in that circuit um, that potentially need to be changed. Um, two of those resistors are effectively around the op amp itself and are on the op amp board. The third is actually on the uh, main control board uh, in the digital section where the op amp, op amp comes in. Um, and what they have told me is that you may need to make some fairly substantial resistor changes there um, to change the resistance of that circuit to make the op amp work properly with a lower change of electrical resistance for the strip itself um, and there is there is no uh, a friend of mine who, who does um, some um, refurbishment of this stuff has told me that it's kind of on a on a on a on a keyboard by keyboard basis that he's had to modify this because he's he's had three of these into his shop in the last couple of years and each one has had to you know he, he said I, I kind of record what I do and he said each one I've had to change the op amp circuit resistors with different values not the same values he said i thought first one first one came in found the found the sort of sweet spot did that and the second one came in i thought i'll just apply the same and it didn't work as well so he said you know it's the electrical properties of this particular strip that comes in here have a profound um, effect on the what how you need to change the resistors which set the gain which tells the tells the digital side of the keyboard how much um after touch to apply. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense to some people. But there you are, the, the next one is after touch. Okay, next one is about firmware. I have been told that the latest firmware for this machine issued by Roland is 3.1. Uh, I can find no, I've, I've looked around the, the internet and people have, have said it is 3.1. I can't find anything from Roland that says 3.1. But the other thing I can't find, having gone through the uh, service manual and gone through the owner's manual, is I can't find any way to actually, any keystrokes, you know, like on other synthesizers like the D70 where you switch it on and press a button and it tells you what version of firmware you're running. I can't find anything on here that tells me that, any key keystroke combination that does that. So um, I'm kind of in the dark in terms of how do you actually tell which version of firmware you've got installed on this thing. Um, so, I think the only way to be sure is to actually open it up and look at the EEPROM. And when you look at the keyboard directly on, the digital side of the board is to the right and the analog side of the board is to the left. And at the bottom of the digital side, you should see the EEPROM chip, which is down there. And it follows the standard Roland um, uh, versioning mechanism, where they put a sticker on the, on the top of the EEPROM and then they put a dot of red or green or black ink over the numbers to represent three dot, one dot, whatever, okay? That's how they do it. They've always done it that way. Was definitely on all the old synths I've seen. Um, so I think that's the only way you can tell which version of the firmware you're on. Now, what a number of people have said is if you're not running 3.1, you probably need to find a copy of 3.1 and get an EEPROM burned and replace the chip you have with the 3.1 version. Um, because that final version of the operating system has a number of uh, annoying bug fixes fixed in it. Um, so that's the recommendation that goes with this. Now, 
there have been a number of conversations about aftermarket versions of the firmware. And I have seen a number of these conversations really around, although they sort of kind of skirt the 8P, they're more focused at the 10, um, where the aftermarket, specific aftermarket mod, uh, firmware modifications are recommended for the synthesizer. Um, because they improve a number of things that Roland didn't improve when they dropped support for the actual platform. Um, and definitely for the for the JX10, it is recommended that you actually take um, a aftermarket firmware mod and install that on your keyboard because it really does sort a number of issues out. What I can't find is whether that recommendation is the same for the 8P. There are a number of aftermarket firmware mods available. If you go hunting them down on the internet, you will find them. Um, but what I can't find is the same degree of acceptance within the community as there were, is with the 10 uh, firmware mod. So what I'm kind of saying here is you need to get at least a 3.1 which is the last supported Roland release. And then it probably is a read the specification of the mod and decide whether the fixes are things that you want and whether you should upgrade the EEPROM to the aftermarket mod EEPROMs. Um, but at least get it up to the latest version of the Roland firmware. And issue six, which I think is the last one of the issues, yeah. So issue six um, that was highlighted to me is this display script. Now, if you notice what I've been doing, I've been I've had my script sitting on top of the keyboard, um, and that's fairly okay because there's nothing in in my scripts that um, would affect the the keyboard itself. But it's all to do with this screen here, which is a frosted bezel of plastic effectively that sits over uh, the screen which is a cathode ray screen that sits underneath it. Now you've got things like the programmer. Now the programmer sits over here and you can see that there is some you know light damage over here which is probably where the programmer has been sitting all its life on this particular keyboard. But people have habits of moving things around on top of there so if the programmer has been moved on top of that screen then it's very possible that could cause damage because it's magnetic underneath. Um, if people have put other things on top of the screen as well, then you know that can cause scratching to the screen. And although you don't realize it, actually, one of the things that actually dulls the screen, because there is no, there's no contrast on this screen or brightness as you might get on a later synth, um, this screen, what you see is what you kind of get. So if the cathode ray on the on the V on the display goes, right, that's it. It's gone, um, and you can't really get aftermarket mods um, for this particular screen, or not that I've seen so far, should I say? So what a couple of people have said is what you really need to do is you really need to just clean this this um, plastic uh, and. What the cleaning will do is it will take out the scratches and then repolish it, um, which will actually improve the visual of the screen itself. Um, they've also said that if you think that you can replace this screen, think again. It, it really is. You'd have to go and buy something and get it custom milled um, to be able to actually replace this screen. So, um, what they've said to me is the best option is effectively to polish out the scratches. And you do that with two particular products. They said the first thing you need to get hold of is a plastic cleaner. Um, and a plastic cleaner will help you remove, it's a mild abrasive, and it will help you remove the deeper scratches that have been put onto this screen. So it's, it's a case of apply it, bit of elbow grease, rub it in, um, try to keep your rubbing in one plane don't try to use circles um, to get rid of the scratches although you might have to use circles to do that and then the second part of the process is then get, get, get some plastic polish and that plastic polish will effectively 
polish the screen and remove the dull nuts and bring up the screen as a very sort of smooth surface, which improves the visuals. Um, so that, that's kind of what they've said to me is the other area because it is, the screen itself is slightly raised, you can feel that, uh, and it's slightly beveled as well. So this center area of the screen, which is right where the eye line is for the, uh, the display, will be the area that takes the most hits effectively. Um, the, now the reason why I'm not gonna actually say um, any product, well, so depending on what territory, where in the world you live, different products will be made available to you for doing this. Uh, and probably the best thing to do is to go to an auto detailing workplace where they do a lot of detailing and ask them what products they use for the plastics and the screens, specifically the screen that sort of sits uh, in front of the instrument panels, because quite often the products they use in auto detailing are the products you will be using to fix this problem. In the UK, there is a German brand called Auto Glim, I think it is, I think it's German. Um, and they make uh, a polish and a cleaner for doing exactly this. But I'm not sure whether you can buy those brands throughout the world, so I'm not gonna you know, concentrate on them. Um, somebody in the States said something called Maguire's, which I can't see you can buy in this, this country. Um, so, you know, my, your best bet is if you need to polish up plastic on a keyboard, is to go to an auto detailing workshop, somebody who does this for, for a living and ask them what products they use because you've got this product. And then nine times out of 10, they'd be happy to have a five minute conversation with you. I'm hoping that this video has been useful to you. Um, if it was, give it a thumbs up and it will give you some, hopefully give you some pointers about some of the things that this thing that might go wrong with your purchase of your JX8P. Um, and on that note, I will leave, leave you with my normal greeting, which is live long and prosper, and I'll see you on the next one.